Hi everyone, welcome to lecture number four. So this is going to be the lecture for week two, part two, where we talk about um, different circulations on Earth. So before we get into today's lecture, I want to go over um, some info for next week. So week three, and so we are already at week three, um, out of only five. So with the summer sessions, they go by so quickly. Um, so our first test will be on Tuesday. So Tuesday being week three, part one, our normal day. Um, on the Canvas page in the modules, you will see there's an additional page there for the test. When you click on the test page, you'll see this purple button that will lead you right to the test, and then also the study guide button, which will download a PDF of the study guide that I made for you guys. So please take advantage of the study guide, go over the different things um, that you should be able to do as you're studying, as well as um, take a look back at your homework questions, at what you've done in discussion sections with your groups, and of course um, the lecture videos and the lecture slides and any personal notes that you might have. So with the test being on Tuesday, we are not going to have a discussion meeting on Tuesday. So week three, part one, we will not have a discussion assignment. It will just be um, the rest of the module. So after you take the test, I suggest starting the module after you take the test because the week three, part one, um, lecture information will not be on the exam. So just up through the end of today's lecture is what will be covered on the test on Tuesday. Um, so you will have a lecture and a lecture quiz and a homework for this week three part one module. Um, it will be shortened. So it will be a shortened lecture because you have uh, the exam and we will not be meeting on Tuesday on Zoom for our discussion. Week three, part two, will be back to usual. So we'll meet at 10.30 for the discussion, um, and you'll have a video, a lecture quiz, and a homework to complete. So I'm going to go over this slide again at the very end of this lecture, just in case, um, and I will make sure that we talk about it on Tuesday, uh, excuse me, on Thursday on Zoom. So with that, uh, Let's get started with today's lecture. So today we're going to be talking um, about atmospheric motion a bit because in order to understand some of the um, surface of ocean circulation, we have to know what's going on in the wind that sits right above the surface of the ocean. So we will go over um, atmospheric motion and then surface circulation and then deep ocean circulation. So there's three components of today's lecture. So for the first component, where we're talking about atmospheric motion, uh, by the end of this section, you should be able to describe how the atmosphere changes in pressure with altitude, as well as explain why air moves and the Coriolis effect. What does the Coriolis effect do to um, air moving in the atmosphere? And then the last thing for this section that we'll talk about is the three cell model of our atmosphere. So you should be able to explain the three cell model and how it affects um, salinity and surface winds. So our atmosphere is by definition the gaseous envelope that surrounds the planet. So you can see here, here's a nice picture. Here we have the Earth, uh, the moon in the distance, and you can actually see um, some of uh, the, the components of our atmosphere here. You can actually see that very thin um, gaseous envelope, as they call it. So let's do a quick review. This should be the first question on your lecture quiz. Um, what are the main gases in our atmosphere today? We talked about this a little bit, I think, in our very first lecture. Let's see if you can remember. What are the main gases in our atmosphere today? Hopefully you remember from week one, wasn't too long ago. Um, number one, the most abundant gas in our atmosphere today is nitrogen. The second most abundant is oxygen. And the third most abundant is argon. 
So when we think about our atmosphere, wow, sorry, this is so blurry right here. Um, you can still see the graph, so that's what matters. Um, when we think about our atmosphere in terms of pressure, we have to think about the vertical. So we're not just thinking about um, walking on the surface of the earth, we're thinking about what happens as we go up into the air, up into the atmosphere. So with increasing altitude, air pressure decreases. So that means that as you go up in the air, uh, the air pressure decreases and the air density decreases. So there's literally less air as you move upwards in the atmosphere. So that's what this is showing here. As you move up in altitude, you get you have less and less and less air pressure. So here's another way to think about it. Um, at the surface, the air density is quite large, allowing us all to breathe. Down at the surface, as you move up, there's less and less air in the space. So the air density is much less and the air pressure is much less because there's less air above you pushing down. So there's much less pressure, much, much less air density as you go up in altitude. So thinking about that, what is the main reason, do you think, what would you guess, that the top of Mount Everest, our tallest mountain, is called the death zone? So the highest point on the surface of the earth, Mount Everest, why would we call the top of Mount Everest the death zone? Take a second to guess. So Mount Everest, the peak of Mount Everest, is at such a high altitude that there is actually less air up there. So there's less air to breathe because the density is so much lower. So you'll notice this graph here shows you Mount Everest. Um, and you'll see that here um, there's significantly less air pressure than, for example, at sea level. So there's much, much less air up there to breathe. It's not that it's cold and it's not that there's a lower percentage of oxygen. It's that there's less air altogether. So there is, yes, less oxygen. So when we think about uh, the atmosphere and our air, we have to think about why does air move in the first place? Why is there wind? Why does air move? Um, and the main reason for atmospheric motion for wind is due to unequal heating. So this, um, this is due to the shape of our Earth as well as... Um, day versus night. So at our equator, so you'll see this figure here, we have our equator in the center. This is where um, the earth receives the most direct sunlight from the earth. So here we will have an excess amount of heat. So we, we um, gain a lot of heat. This at the equator is where the earth is absorbing the most heat. You have the most direct sunlight coming in from the sun. As you go um, up in latitude, in latitude or south in latitude, um, as you get to the higher latitudes towards the poles, the surface is receiving much less direct sunlight than at the equator. So here we are receiving less heat. So it's going to be cooler. So there's extra heat essentially at the equator. The equator is where the earth is absorbing the most amount of sunlight. Um, at the poles, the uh, at the poles, the surface receives much less direct sunlight than at the equator. So, what happens is warm air rises. So we talked about this briefly. to expand 
Remember thermal expansion? So as our air warms, that air will expand. That means the water, uh, excuse me, the air molecules will actually be further apart, which means there will be low pressure. There's not as much air um, in this area. There's not as much air pushing down at the surface. That means there's going to be low air pressure because there's not as much air. The molecules are further apart in this same volume of air due to the heating. Because there is low pressure, because it is less dense, that air is going to rise up through the cooler air. So the warm air will rise to the surface. What happens then in an area that is the opposite? So where we have cooler air. So now this air, let's say, is cooler because it is further from the surface. Generally, in the most part, our cool air is uh, um, above in the atmosphere. So we have our cool air. That cool air is going to shrink. That is um, the opposite of thermal expansion. We have thermal compression. So because that cool air is colder, it's going to shrink a little bit. That means it's going to become more dense. The molecules will be even closer together. And it's going to be a very high pressure. So we would say there's high air pressure. There's a lot of air in this area. So that dense, cool air is going to sink. So what this ends up doing is creating a circulation. So we end up with some sort of circulation here. With warm air rising, that warm air is eventually going to hit a point where it is furthest from the surface of the Earth, so it will start to cool, and then it can move, uh, uh, it can stop rising. It will then move to either side. If you notice in this diagram, it's moving to both sides, this air. Um, as it makes its way across the upper atmosphere here, eventually it will get to an area where it's so cold that it will sink. This sinking air will eventually hit the surface of the Earth and have to go somewhere, so it will go out to the sides. Um, along the surface of the Earth, it will warm up until it gets to this region, back again, that is um, extra warm. Has that extra warming, it's going to cause the air to rise. So the change in temperature, so warm next to cold, creates this circulation. Because the warm air is going to rise, cool air is going to sink. What that does is you're not going to run out of air up top. There's this area is going to pull more air in from the surrounding. So instead of running out of air here, because this area all dropped to the surface, of course, this upper atmosphere here will pull air in from the sides to replace. So this difference in temperatures, which causes a difference in density and air pressure, is what causes our atmosphere to have circulations, is what causes us to have atmospheric motion, which what we call at the surface is wind. So if our Earth was were not spinning, so our Earth spins, spins once a day, that's why we have day and night. Um, if our Earth was not spinning, our circulation would look something like this, where we have the warmest part of our Earth is at the equator, where the equator is getting the most direct sunlight. So that's going to be the warmest part. At that very warmest part on the surface of the Earth, we would have air rising. So these arrows here are showing um, up in the atmosphere. So you can sort of think um, of this as the atmosphere along this side of the Earth. So at your equator, we would have air rising, just like this is showing. It's warm air. Uh, when it gets to a certain point where it can't rise anymore, the air would go out to either side, and it would start making its way towards the pole. As it moves uh, north or south, away from the warmest part of our Earth, which is the equator, it's going to start to cool. So that's why this figure shows the arrow going from the red to the blue as the air starts to cool. When it gets to the North Pole is when the air is cool enough that it becomes dense enough that it will actually sink. So it will sink back down to the surface of the Earth 
And then it will have to start making its way back towards the equator because as it sinks, it hits the surface of the Earth. It's going to have to go out to either side. So you can imagine um, these arrows would be repeated on this side of the Earth, actually all the way around the Earth. So at the North Pole, the very coldest part, the air is going to be the most dense on Earth. It will drop down to the surface, and then it will start making its way back towards the equator along the surface. When it gets to a certain point closer to the equator, it's going to start warming up again because it will be receiving that more direct sunlight. Then it will start rising. So this is what we call the one cell model because each hemisphere has one circulation cell. That's what we call um, these circulations here. So one cell. This is what would happen if our Earth was on its axis, the same as it is now, but if it were not rotating, it were not spinning. We would have hot air, hot air rising at the equator, cool air rising at the poles. That would create this circulation. The only thing is that we do actually spin. As we know, our Earth spins. So our Earth is rotating. It's rotating on its axis once a day. And what that causes is something called the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis effect is an apparent force that is caused by the rotation of the Earth. And it changes the direction of moving objects. And by that I mean uh, wind or water currents, for example. So this Coriolis effect, because our Earth is spinning, it causes things to turn. So I have a couple of GIFs to try and show you what I mean by that. So here we are in this cartoon globe here. And if we move this ball directly south, so it's the ball is traveling on this white line. It's moving from the north to the south. The ball is moving completely straight. Let's say it's an airplane in our atmosphere. It's flying completely straight, a very straight line, this white line. You see the red ball never leaves the white line. However, the Earth is spinning beneath this airplane, beneath this ball. So as the airplane is flying in a perfectly straight line, the Earth spins beneath it. So what this ends up doing is the path of the ball on the surface of the Earth is curved. This is because of that rotation beneath the ball, beneath the airplane, beneath the wind, for example. So even though the ball is trying to go straight, it's actually following a curved path along the surface of the Earth. This is called Coriolis. So it's uh, it can be pretty difficult to wrap your mind around. So I have a few different GIFs and videos to try and show you. Um, the Coriolis effect in the northern hemisphere is always going to deflect to the right. So to the right of the direction of the motion. So to the right of the direction of the uh, wind, of the airplane, of the ocean current. So you'll notice that here, uh, the airplane, let's say it was an airplane, is flying straight along that blue line. Uh, excuse me, it's flying straight along, it's supposed to fly on that gray line, but it's actually deflected to the right. So to the right of the flight path, which is the gray line, um, you end up deflecting to the right. In the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis deflects to the left. So the southern hemisphere, it's always deflected to the left. And in order to remember this, I remember that I am sitting in the northern hemisphere, so I am always right. That's not true, I'm not always right, but that is how I remember this. Make sure that you remember the northern hemisphere to the right. Northern Hemisphere, to the right. Southern Hemisphere, to the left. And there is no Coriolis effect at our equator. So this is only for 
motion in either the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. So the Coriolis effect is going to be stronger, uh, more severe for objects that are moving fast and or objects that are covering longer distances. And one trick or tip to always um, double check is you always want to think along the direction of the movement. So for example, this picture is a little wonky. You kind of have to turn your head to see the direction of the motion to realize that this is actually a right turn. So you always, if we were in class, I would say you want to flip your paper around to make sure you're looking in the right direction. With a computer screen, you're going, you're going to want to turn your head, make sure you're looking in the right direction to determine is that a right turn or a left turn? Or which way do I draw my arrow? Am I in the northern hemisphere? I have to make sure I'm drawing an arrow to the right of the direction of the motion. So the right of the direction of the wind or the ocean current. So here is another example where we have uh, this flight path in gray, the way that the plane is trying to fly. Um, but as it flies, it turns to the right. So in this situation, you sort of have to flip your computer around or imagine because the flight direction is from north to south. So you have to imagine that along this path from north to south, uh, this is actually a right turn. So you might have to flip 180 degrees to realize that this is a right hand turn because we are in the northern hemisphere. So another way that this can be shown is with this experiment or this GIF. Um, this person down here on the bottom, it's just repeating the same thing over and over. He is trying to throw this soccer ball to the girl in the white t-shirt. This one. But as he throws it, they are spinning. So when he first throws the ball, by the time the ball gets to her, she's actually spun and is no longer in that location. So she can't catch it. So he is throwing it straight to her. But as the ball is in the air, the, um, the, their positions have spun. So he throws the ball straight across from him. However, by the time the ball gets there, she isn't there anymore because she's moving. So this is another way to think about Coriolis. Um, there's lots of different um, videos and descriptions online, even if you look on YouTube for other um, examples of Coriolis. It sometimes takes a couple of tries and a couple of read-throughs and a couple of um, times looking at these GIFs and these um, definitions to fully wrap your mind around it because it is a very bizarre effect, the Coriolis effect. But it's one of those things that once you get it, you've got it generally. So the key is to remember that the northern hemisphere Coriolis deflects to the right because we're always right when we're at UCI in the northern hemisphere. That's how I remember it. Um, and to, in the southern hemisphere, you will uh, the Coriolis will deflect to the left. So this is important when we get to um, ocean currents. It is going to be important also for our atmospheric motion. So if you remember, this is our one cell model. So this would work for a planet that had an atmosphere just like ours, but that was not spinning, which probably wouldn't exist now that I think about it. This is the one cell model. So what is happening on our Earth is that we actually have a three cell model. So it sort of starts at the basis of this one cell model where we still have the most direct sunlight at the equator and uh, the coldest, least direct at the North Pole. So we have that um, rising air at the equator, just like we did in the one cell model because here we have um, the uh, highest warming. But what happens is that due to the rotation of our Earth is the rotation actually splits that one cell model. That one cell is much too large to exist 
um, on the scale of our Earth, which is spinning, actually spits, splits it excuse me, into three cells. So we have three different cells that work like uh, gears, gears on a bike or in a car. So here is our rising motion at the equator, and we also know that we will have sinking motion at the poles. So that is true from our first one cell model. We have rising motion due to the heat at the equator. We have sinking motion at the poles. But we have three different cells in between. So if we have rising motion here, we know that this cell needs to be completed. If we have sinking motion here, this cell will be completed. And then the cell in between is actually going to be opposite because it needs to work like gears. If we have sinking motion due to um, this cell here, this is causing sinking motion at 30 degrees north. So we have sinking motion at 30 degrees north due to the heating at the equator. We also have sinking motion at the uh, 90 degrees at our poles because we know that it's very cold, which means there's going to be rising motion at 60 degrees. So rising motion at 60 degrees and sinking motion at 30 degrees is going to create this third cell in between. So it works like gears. Where there's rising motion, there's rising motion. Where there's sinking motion, you have sinking motion. So if you're looking just at one um, quarter of the Earth here, you notice that it is then just repeated on the other parts of the Earth. The other thing to notice here is um, our surface wind. So our surface wind is in the green arrows. We know that we have rising motion at the equator due to the excess heat. We have sinking motion at 30 degrees. So along our surface, the air is going to move from 30 degrees to zero degrees. The air is going to move from a cooler area of higher pressure towards a warmer area of low pressure. Air always moves from high to low. From high pressure to low pressure. There's way more air here, not enough air here. The air is going to try and reach equilibrium by moving from high pressure, this cooler area, to low pressure. However, it's not going to be a straight line because of Coriolis, exactly. So instead of these green lines being straight lines with air moving directly from 30 degrees to zero degrees, it is curved. So along our direction of motion, so you sort of have to flip your computer screen around or do a headstand to look in the direction of our motion. As this is moving, it turns to its right. The same thing happens in the other parts of the Earth. So here we have our higher pressure, colder air, moving towards lower pressure, warmer air because of this cell. However, it is not going to be straight. It's not a straight line because of Coriolis. So the same exact thing happens. Here, instead of moving directly straight from high to low, the air is going to um, curve to the right. So the air is deflected to the right. So the three cell model, there's a lot going on, but you're just going to want to remember the, um, the key components, that there's rising air at the equator, that there is sinking air at the poles, and that creates the different cells. And then you can always determine your um, direction of surface wind motion by remembering the air is going to move from high to low, and in the northern hemisphere, it will be deflected to the right. Let's look at the southern hemisphere real quick. We have this um, identical uh, cell here because there's rising motion at our equator, which means there will be sinking motion here at 30 degrees. Then the surface motion is going to move from, uh, excuse me, the surface air is going to move from 30 degrees to zero degrees. The air will move, of course, from high to low, high pressure to low pressure but it's not going to be a straight line. In the southern hemisphere, it will be deflected to the left. In the southern hemisphere, instead of 
going straight, our air is deflected to the left. So uh, this has a big factor when we are looking at um, our salinity and temperatures of our ocean. So I showed this figure on in Tuesday's lecture. So here we're going to get a little bit more into how the atmosphere controls the salinity and the temperature across the surface of the earth. So here we have our, oh, excuse me. Um, here we go. So our salinity and our surface temperature the surface temperature of the earth is controlled, excuse me, of the oceans is controlled by the sunlight coming in. So the maximum sunlight is at the equator. That is where we're going to have uh, the warmest ocean water. So it's similar to how you would think about um, uh, the average heat of the earth. The most direct sunlight is coming in at the equator. That is where we are going to have our warmest temperatures. As you move away from the equator to either pole, the temperature is going to decrease. Salinity, however, does not follow the same pattern. We actually have low salinity at the equator and at the poles, high salinity at the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer around 30 degrees north and south. So if we look at our um, three cell model here, it's actually going to rather clearly explain this pattern of salinity. So why is there low salinity at the equator? Well, let's take a look. Low salinity at the equator, if you remember, um, salinity can change by adding or removing fresh water. So we went over this in lecture on Tuesday. I know I had a homework question where you had to think about um, how things are affected by the addition of fresh water, the removal of fresh water. So in an area where there is rising warm air, that rising warm air will generally create a lot of clouds. So if we were in um, ESS 5, the atmosphere class, we would get into this diagram in a lot of depth. For this class, we're just going to talk about the main components. So one interesting thing is that when warm air rises, it creates clouds. It's going to rain. So at our low pressure areas where we have warm air rising up because that air is low pressure, it's low density because of the warmth, it's going to rise up and create clouds. So at these low pressure areas where this figure has clouds, it's going to be um, generally rainy. So you're going to have a very rainy climate right along our equator. Excess rain is adding water to this area, which means we're going to have um, less salty water. We're adding more fresh water. We're diluting that um, salt water. So at your equator, because there is generally excess rain, it's a very rainy region, you're going to have lower salinity. If we look at these two peaks in salinity, you might have guessed what's coming next. Yes, they align very well with these um, high pressure areas. So where we have sinking air, because it's cooler air, it is sinking down, you generally have very, very clear skies. So these clear skies, which are shown by suns, are due to that sinking air. Um, all the weather is just uh, brought to the surface and sort of squashed. There will be a very limited um, cloudy poor weather at uh, 30 degrees north and south. So that very sunny region is going to experience more oceanic evaporation. So if you're removing water, you're going to increase the salinity of this area. So we generally have higher salinity at around 30 degrees, where we have this generally very sunny weather. So we have very sunny, high evaporation here, causing these double peaks in both hemispheres in salinity. We have a very rainy equator region, which is causing that um, lower salinity at 
the uh, excuse me at the equator. So when we look at a graph such as this, this is a map of um, ocean surface or ocean surface salinity. You'll see that at around 30 degrees is where we have our highest salinity values. So it's generally 20 to 30 degrees. We have our highest salinity values. Um, at the equator, you will have lower, but not quite as low as the poles. And if you remember, the poles are going to have the absolute lowest salinity because that is where we are creating uh, sea ice. So in both poles, in both of their winter times, they currently create sea ice each year. That freezing of the sea ice is going to um, add all of the ice to the ocean. So freezing of sea ice is essentially removing fresh water from the ocean. You're just freezing it on top. So that is going to create very salty waters at our poles. So both of the poles are going to have a very salty, very um, salty areas. So then what happens is in the poles summertime, that sea ice will start to melt and that water will be added back into the system. So it depends which season you are looking at your figure um, to determine if the pole is going to be very salty or if it will be more neutral. And also you'll be able to see a difference between the salinity of the poles depending on which one is experiencing winter or freezing time, which one is experiencing summer or thawing, melting of that sea ice time. So if the wind is blowing from 30 degrees south to 60 degrees south, which arrow would correctly show the path of the wind? So this is, of course, another question in your lecture quiz. The air is blowing from 30 degrees south to 60 degrees south. So it's blowing from here on our screen to down here. Which arrow shows the path of the wind? So the key here is to notice that I said 30 degrees south to 60 degrees south. So in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect will deflect air to the left, the southern hemisphere to the left. So as air is moving sort of from the top of the screen down to the bottom, it's going to be deflected along this line of motion to the left. So what I have to do here is pick up my laptop and flip it around so that I am looking at, I have my laptop upside down right now, you guys should know that. I am looking at my screen upside down so that I can follow the air from 30 degrees to 60 degrees and see that letter C is in fact deflecting to the left. So letter C to the left of the direction of the motion is the correct answer here. So our atmospheric circulation to summarize, it does not match that three cell model perfectly. The three cell conceptual model is called a conceptual model because it is just that, a conceptual model. Uh, it is not a perfect description. It's a very simplified understanding of our atmosphere. So there are a lot of other things that do affect atmospheric motion, being um, the tilt, of the earth, the fact that we have seasons, and the fact that um, our continents are not evenly distributed across the surface of the earth. So there are some things that cause our atmospheric circulation to be a little off from the three cell model, but it is a very good first understanding of how our atmosphere works. So for the next, for the last part of our um, lecture today, I'm going to go through surface ocean circulation and then deep ocean circulation. I've split it up a little between the two because they are quite different. Now surface ocean circulation has to do significantly with wind direction, which is why I wanted to start 
with a little understanding of how the atmosphere moves and why we have wind. So for our surface ocean motion, oh, that's a tongue twister. Um, the outcomes for this section are, I hope that by the end of this point, you are able to uh, describe some methods of measuring ocean circulation as well as describe and draw out some diagrams for the Ekman spiral and Ekman transport. And then the same for uh, subtropical gyres. So gyres in the northern and southern hemisphere, all five of the main gyres, as well as upwelling and downwelling and how this affects the life in our oceans. And then we will talk about the different mechanisms that cause upwelling and or downwelling to occur and what that has to do with uh, life in the surface of our oceans. After this, we will get into uh, deep ocean circulation. So ocean circulation in general So ocean circulation in general is very similar to atmospheric cir circulation. The oceans are always in motion uh, due to transfer of heat. So just like the atmosphere, um, heat is transferred from warmer to cooler areas. And this is how people used to travel around the world. There is an abundance of life in our surface ocean. Um, so the surface ocean where the water can receive sunlight, there is a huge amount of life, very much affected by nutrients in our, in our oceans, which is very much affected by circulation. So we separate surface circulation from deep ocean circulation because the surface circulation of our ocean, we're talking about the surface of the ocean, so the very topmost part of our ocean, that circulation is driven by the wind, so driven by atmospheric motion. Deep ocean circulation is driven by density of water. So first we will get into a surface circulation. So how do we measure ocean circulation? There's a couple of different ways. There are some direct and indirect methods. So you can um, actually track something that's floating and track its path. Where does it go? You see it floating in the surface of the ocean. That's going to tell you um, how the surface ocean moves. Uh, you can also use specific instruments um, in the ocean to measure the flow and the direction of the flow. Indirect methods would be uh, using satellite, using uh, Doppler flow meters, or trying to track temperature and salinity to see how water masses are moving. So there have been some um, accidental experiments for studying surface ocean circulation. So in 1990, um, about 31,000 pairs of shoes, Nike shoes, spilled off of a container ship. The container ship broke open and uh, oceanographers actually used these shoes to learn that um, in the Pacific Northwest, the flow or the ocean currents move almost directly towards the shore and then move in either directions. So they were able to do this by tracking the shoes. So they waited to see where these Nike shoes would wash up on the shore. So they found shoes um, in Canada, in Alaska, all the way down into Washington and Oregon. Uh, something similar happened a few years later in 1992. Um, there were toys called Friendly Floaties. So that's what's pictured here. Um, they're unique little kid toys sort of for the bathtub because they have no holes in them. So they don't, they're hollow. They don't have any holes, so they don't take in water. So they float. So there were ducks, little beavers, turtles, and frogs, these plastic colored um, animals that spilled in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in 1992. So a container ship with um, almost 29,000 of these friendly floaty toys spilled. 
And the same oceanographers that studied the Nike sneakers decided that this would also be a great way um, to find the different paths that these toys take. So they used the path of these floating plastic toys to measure ocean surface currents because the path that they take, they're just floating along the currents. So they found, um, they were finding these toys for up to 15 years. So 15 years after the spill, they were still finding toys in Europe because they, the, um, Toys had gone all the way up into the North Pole. Some of them had been frozen in sea ice for many, many years before they finally drifted. Uh, this is a uh, an interesting map, but it finally drifted a little, melted, and then would be over here. Um, as the ice melted, they were then able to come south and then get caught in the jet stream. Uh, excuse me. Uh... Uh, get caught in this current here and then be brought up to Europe. So it was more than 15 years later that they found um, the last bit of these friendly floaty toys. So along with accidental spills in the ocean, there are actual scientific um, equipment deployed to measure uh, oceanic information. We have what we call the Argo floats. So Argo floats are floats that are um, put in the ocean actually all over the world and they can float. So they can float up and down. They can be at the surface. They can float down to one kilometer, hang out there a little bit. Then they can descend all the way down to almost two kilometers before they come back up to the surface and send their information via satellite. So these are completely um, independent. They don't need, uh, they're not plugged in, of course. These are in the middle of the ocean. Constantly collecting data and constantly sending data out to satellite. So it's about a 10-day cycle for the satellite to, uh, excuse me, for the Argo float to reach the surf. It will be at the surface. It will head down about halfway, it'll hang out about one kilometer deep, then it will drop to its deepest point before coming back up and sending more information to the satellite. And then it starts all over again. So these are all over the world collecting constant data so that we know what's happening in our oceans. So here is a map um, from February showing all of the locations of these floats that we have in the world. So we have almost 4,000 of these constantly collecting oceanic information, which is so cool. So when we think about surface currents, we see a very messy map that looks like this. Here, um, the red arrows are warmer currents. The blue arrows are cooler currents. The green thick arrows on top are showing the... Um, wind, so atmospheric motion. So you'll notice in some places the surface currents match up with the winds. Some places not so much. So the winds drive surface circulation. So the reason we have surface circulation is because of wind, but it is not a simple process. So what happens is what we call the Ekman transport. So on the surface of the earth, uh, on the surface of the ocean, the wind drags the ocean water. So on the surface, the wind is going to um, pull the ocean water with it. As you go down, so this is now going down if you swam or free dove directly down, straight down into the ocean, we're looking at the different levels of the ocean. So each level is pulled by the level above it. So each layer of ocean is pulled by the ocean above it. So what happens is the net or the average motion of this whole column, even though it is somewhat of a spiral, is actually going to move 90 degrees to the direction of the wind. So the average motion of the water column 
is going to be 90 degrees to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere. The average motion of the water column in the southern hemisphere would be 90 degrees to the left of the wind. This is due to, of course, the Coriolis force. So exactly what we talked about at the start of class. So if you remember, the northern hemisphere to the right, southern hemisphere to the left, it's back. You have to remember that again for the Ekman transport. So when we talk about the average or the net water movement of the entire water column, the average motion will be to the right in the northern hemisphere, 90 degrees from the direction of the wind, the yellow arrow. So here is a little bit more of a breakdown about what's happening. The wind pulls the surface ocean and then friction of each level of the sort of each layer of the ocean affects the layer beneath it. So if there was no Coriolis effect, the water would just flow directly towards the wind. But due to the Coriolis effect, the surface current is actually going to be pulled just a little to the right in the northern hemisphere. So each layer below the surface is going to be pulled a little bit more to the right and a little bit more to the right, a little bit more to the right. But as you go further downward in depth, the strength of that friction, the strength of that pull is going to get less and less. So you'll notice, here's our wind direction. We are in the northern hemisphere in this diagraph, diagram. Here's the yellow wind direction. Our surface current, so the surface of the ocean, is pulled a little to the left. Uh, oh my gosh, a little to the right, excuse me. So the surface current is pulled a little bit to the right. And then the layers beneath are continuing to be pulled to the right. But the vectors are getting smaller because the strength of this, um, this force pulling to the right is going to get smaller and smaller the deeper you go. So the deeper you go, the less you will feel the effect of the Ekman transport. That's why there is this spiral you can see in the diagram, but it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the average, that's why we say the average of this column is going to be moving 90 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere. The surface wind will only be flowing between 20 and 45 degrees to the right of the wind. So which diagram, A or B, is showing the southern hemisphere. Take a second to look at both of these. Try to determine which diagram is showing the southern hemisphere. So hopefully you're remembering that Coriolis in the southern hemisphere deflects to the left. So you wanna look for the diagram where this, the water is deflected to the left of the direction of the wind. So that would be here, B. So here is our wind vector, and our water is deflected to the left. B would be the southern hemisphere. So um, a little summary, the surface motion, so things on the surface of the ocean, the ship, the iceberg, um, they're going to move about 45 degrees to the right, this is the northern hemisphere, see right here, 45 degrees to the right of the wind. So here is our wind vector. Our icebergs and our ships are going to move about 45 degrees to the right. But the net transport of the whole column of water is actually 90 degrees to the right of the wind. So the average of this whole column of water is actually moving to the right. But the things floating on the surface will move in between, sort of 45 degrees between the wind. So this then brings us to gyres. So gyres are giant circulations in our ocean basins that are due to the wind and the fact that we have continents. So this is a little graphic to show you 
the five main gyres, they're in our five biggest ocean basins. And in the northern hemisphere, you will notice that the two gyres in the northern hemisphere are moving clockwise. And so on this one. And then those in the southern hemisphere are moving counterclockwise. So the three in the southern hemisphere are moving counterclockwise. Now this is due to the fact that there are continents and our wind patterns. So our gyres, the gyres are the reason for something you might have seen in the news or online, which is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So we might talk about this a little bit more at the end of class when we get into more of the human aspects of um, oceanography and the human impacts. But what happens is all of the garbage that is in the North Pacific ends up stuck in this circulation, in this gyre. So we have this large scale circulation here and all of the garbage, which ends up in our ocean, will slowly um, get circulated into this gyre and will get totally stuck in this um, circulation. So we have this huge area of trash and teeny, 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 tiny pieces of trash. Um, they say it is more than twice the size of Texas. It's not really known because it's very hard to measure, um, but there is quite a bit of garbage in the um, Great Pacific garbage patch. And the reason that it is all stuck in one patch, as they call it, is because of the ocean circulation, because of this circulating gyre here. So, oops, excuse me. Um, if we go back to this figure, uh, you'll notice that you have all of these circulations here creating what we call the North Pacific subtropical gyre. So this gyre number one is due to the uh, wind patterns affecting our oceans and then what happens is the water hits a continent so it has to move. The water hits a continent. Here it hits a continent it creates this circulation. So due to the wind effect pushing our water as well as um, our continental boundaries, so sort of the boundaries of our oceans, we create these circulations. So there will be a large scale circular circulation in each ocean basin. So the largest one with the most amount of trash that we are aware of anyway um, is the Pacific. So if you saw this diagram here, there's land on both sides. And we have a circulation here. Here's a gyre. I've drawn the arrows. Which hemisphere would you be in? If this was the direction of motion for this gyre. Take a second, try and guess. So notice that the circulation is counterclockwise. I have counterclockwise circulation in this gyre in this ocean basin. That means we would be looking at the southern hemisphere. If you remember the GIF that I showed, oops, here we see clockwise circulation in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So the answer here would be southern. So these gyres um, are what make up the coastal currents. So, so the currents along our ocean uh, excuse me, along our coastlines have a lot to do with the climate of the people that live along those coastlines. So along a warmer current, so say on the east coast of the U.S., this is a warmer current because here is our gyre. So the North Atlantic gyre is going to constantly be bringing water that's closer to the equator up towards the poles. So this gyre is going to bring warm water up along the east coast of the U.S. Once it gets up um, more towards the pole, that water is going to cool off. That cooler water is then going to be brought down um, along the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So the same thing happens in the Pacific. 
We have warmer water brought up along the western Pacific Ocean. And then there's cooler water that is transported south along the eastern Pacific or along the west coast of the U.S. So warmer currents translate to warmer and also more humid continent uh, climates on the coast. Colder currents translate to cooler and drier climates. So if you had to guess, um, which climate would be more humid? Eastern Australia or Western South America? So this question, we're looking at the South Pacific Dryer here. So which would be more humid? Eastern Australia here or Western South America? You would want to say Eastern Australia because that is where you have warmer currents. So the warm water from the equator is being brought down along the coast of Eastern Australia, going to keep Eastern Australia warmer and also more humid. So there are also um, some less tropical gyres, uh, less tropical, excuse me, um, less common gyres. So those would be the polar gyres. So there are subpolar gyres that um, are caused by very similar re reasons. So the flow of the wind along with the continents, we do create subpolar gyres both in the North Pole and the South Pole, but they're much smaller than the main five um, ocean basin gyres. But I thought I should mention them. It's not just the main five. Um, we do see uh, smaller, uh, less severe subpolar gyres in both the North Pole and South Pole regions. So the last part of today's lecture is going to be about deep ocean circulation. So now that we are masters of surface ocean circulation, gyres, upwelling, downwelling, um, we can go into what's happening in the deep ocean. So today uh, for this section, we're going to talk about deep water masses and intermediate water masses. Um, we'll talk about stratification of water masses as well as uh, the thermal haline circulation. We'll talk about the thermal haline circulation changes and how this might affect our climate. So this is the same slide I showed earlier, ocean circulation. There are two types. Remember the surface ocean circulation, which we just talked about, is all dependent on the wind. Right now we are going to go over the deep circulation, which is driven by density. So at some point around 400 meters, um, the Ekman transport, the Ekman spiral fizzles out and the ocean no longer feels the effect of the surface winds. So that is what we consider deep water from 400 meters to below, where the um, motion and the circulation is driven just by density. So, uh, Deep ocean circulation is due to density differences in masses of water. So there's one deep ocean circulation. It is all interconnected and we call it the thermohaline circulation. That's the arrows that you see on the bottom. So the thermohaline circulation, we call it that because uh, thermo is temperature, haline is uh, salinity. So the thermohaline circulation is affected um, is caused by density changes, excuse me. So this controls about 90% of ocean motion. So about 90% of the ocean circulation is due to this thermohaline circulation. It's very, very slow, much slower than the surface current motion. So there's sort of two components. We have the warm shallow currents, which are um, up towards the surface, not on the surface, but up towards the surface. And then uh, the deep cooler currents in the blue. So the deep cooler currents are along the bottom of the ocean floor. Uh, the warmer ocean currents are up in more shallow water. 
So here I have a brief video to show. The global conveyor belt is the major system that carries heat in Earth's ocean. The heat transport of the system helps to moderate Earth's climate. This model shows in a simple way how heat is transported from the low and mid latitudes to the far north Atlantic. Shallow currents are warm and shown as red. Deep cold currents are colored blue. The moving pulse shows the general direction in which ocean currents flow. Cold, deep currents travel east past Africa. Some part of the flow rises in the Indian Ocean. The rest of the cold current continues flowing toward the North Pacific Ocean. In the Pacific, the current becomes warmer and less salty and migrates as a surface current toward the North Atlantic. In the North Atlantic, dry winter air cools the ocean surface. This removes heat from ocean waters and makes them salty and dense. When this water sinks to great depth, the global conveyor belt again begins its worldwide circuit. So I like that video because it shows you more in three dimensions. Um, the figure from the previous slide, for example, um, is a little hard to see because it's just two dimensions, that map. Uh, I like this video because it shows you the three dimensions of the red, which is the warm current, um, sinking down and cooling as it reaches the bottom. But now it's a cool current. Oh. The system helps. So which water mass would be the most dense? of these four options. This is a review question. So I hope that you all guessed cold and salty. I hope that you all guessed confidently um, cold and salty. So the most dense water mass is going to be the cold and salty water mass. So Water from uh, different spots in the ocean, different locations, we call them water masses because they will have um, specific temperatures and salinity, including um, nutrients, what kind of dissolved gases they are. And it's a way, the names of what we call these water masses are due to where they form. And that will tell us uh, what to expect in terms of temperature and salinity. So the main water masses that we have are the Antarctic bottom water, Antarctic intermediate water, North Atlantic deep water, North Atlantic central surface, central surface water, and the Mediterranean intermediate water. So these are the main water masses that we have in our oceans. So this is a graph, you've seen a similar graph before, of temperature, salinity, and density. So these blue diagonal or curved lines are showing the density and how they relate to salinity and temperature. So what we have here are these five different water masses, abbreviated, and plotted on this chart where they fall in terms of salinity and temperature. So for example, um, AAIW has a lower salinity than um, MIW. MIW has a higher temperature than AABW. That is sort of how you read this graph. So, if I give you a few seconds, which is the order of water masses from the surface to the deep ocean? So if these water masses were in order, from uh, surface to deep ocean, what would the order be? Take a second to try and figure this out. So in order to put these water masses in order, 
we want to remember that we want to put them in order of density. So the least dense water is always going to be at the surface. The most dense water will always be at uh, the bottom, the bottom of the ocean. So that means we're going to look at these blue curved lines. So which water mass has the uh, lowest density, the least dense? This one. So we would have one, which would come next? Antarctic intermediate water here. Then we'd have the Mediterranean. Then we'd have the North Atlantic deep water. Then the Antarctic bottom water. And I'm following just the density values here. So if we were just to read the density values, so these are pretty similar, but you'll notice that this does have a higher density. It has a range, that's why it's a large rectangle, but it does have higher density, so that's why this comes first. So the answer would be B. So one, two, three, four, five. Just reading in order of density because the uh, density is going to control the order in terms of the vertical ordering of these water masses. Now when we put our water masses in that vertical density order, it is called stratification. And it is something that happens completely naturally. That's why we're able to put them in order because we know exactly how they will fall. So stratification is the fact that the ocean actually and the atmosphere will naturally put itself in order from of in terms of density. So the most dense will always be at the bottom. The least dense will always be at the top. So here is another um, figure of that. If we look at this cross section here, which is labeled just by water mass, um, you can see that here is the actual data with uh, salinity. So you'll notice that the lower salinities are at the bottom, the higher salinities are here at the top. So in our thermal haline circulation, in those water masses, you might have noticed that some of them were called deep water or bottom water. Deep water formation is a really important component of this thermal haline circulation. Deep water formation or bottom water formation is caused by um, increasing the density of other water. So you're making the water very, very salty and cold, either by making water that's already salty colder or by making water that's already cold salty. So in the North Atlantic, there's salty water that gets very, very cold. In the Antarctic, we have cold water that gets very, very salty. So what happens for the North Atlantic deep water is the Gulf Stream here, and this is the um, Atlantic. So the Gulf Stream is going to bring salty water from uh, the tropics. So this is a region of um, high salinity due to a lot of evaporation. Remember that from many slides ago. It's going to bring this water up to the North Pole, uh, up towards the North Pole. Um, up in latitude, the Gulf Stream brings this water north. Once it gets so far north, it starts to cool. When it cools enough, it becomes very, very dense. It already has high salt, salt content, so it becomes very, very dense, and it's going to sink down. That is how we create what we call North Atlantic deep water. It's just because the Gulf Stream is going to bring water to the north, and it's going to get cold. For Antarctic bottom water, uh, the waters uh, can be relatively fresh, but it's very cold. So it starts cold, and then what happens is um, sea ice will be forming. So around Antarctica, as our sea ice forms, uh, salt will be expelled. Salt is released into the water. That salt will mix with the water below, increasing density. So here we have very, very cold water. We're adding additional salt, 
So now it's cold and very salty. It's going to sink to the very bottom. Um, this will be the bottommost water. So the Antarctic bottom water is the coldest and the saltiest, the most dense um, water mass that we have. So the intermediate waters are cold and salty, but not as cold and not as salty as our deep waters. So we say they're cold, but a little fresh. For example, if you take very, very cold water, but you make it a little bit fresher, that is sort of how you create Antarctic intermediate water, as well as North Pacific intermediate water. Um, when you have warm water that gets very salty, that's what we call Mediterranean intermediate water. So either you're taking cold water and making it less salty, making it a little more fresh, or you're taking warm water and making it salty. So it's not both very, very cold and very, very salty. Like the bottom water, it's more intermediate, exactly from the word. So this is um, the same slide to show again that Antarctic bottom water is going to be the most dense all the way at the bottom. And then we will have our North Atlantic deep water. Then we will have um, the intermediate waters above. So you'll notice that the Antarctic intermediate water, um, it actually appears to be much uh, saltier than the other water. It's because it is um, warmer. So because it is warmer, it means it's not going to sink below. Even though it does have a high salt content, um, it's not quite as cold, so it's not going to be as dense. So, oh, excuse me. Um, the thermal haline circulation is driven by the deep ocean formation. Deep ocean formation is driven by the thermal haline circulation. So they sort of work together. We call it the great ocean conveyor belt because it is constantly moving. We have warm water moving up the Gulf Stream, sinking down when it gets cold. That cold water is going to move along the bottom of the ocean uh, where it will uh, eventually combine with the bottom water circulation around the South Pole. Um, we also have areas of warm water that become cool and then very, very salty, so they will sink. So these areas of sinking motion is where we create that uh, deep ocean or bottom water. It's really what drives this entire thermohaline circulation. So changes to the thermohaline circulation are something to be aware of and be um, wary of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say afraid of, but the North Atlantic deep water needs to be dense in order to sink. So this water here, it needs to have high, dense, high density in order to sink. Which of these factors would reduce the density in the North Atlantic? So which of these would reduce the density, making it more difficult for that dense, for that deep water to So which of these is going to reduce the density in the North Atlantic? Formation of sea ice is where we're freezing fresh water. So we're removing fresh water, which means you're making the water saltier. Evaporation, you're also removing fresh water, making the water saltier. So both of those are going to increase the density in the North Atlantic. However, if we start melting the land ice, for example, up here in Greenland, the ice sheet that is very close to where this deep water formation occurs, we would in fact be reducing the density. So melting all of this fresh water in Greenland is going to reduce the density of the water in the North Atlantic. You're adding fresh water to that ocean water. So changes in the thermohaline uh, circulation <coughs> could be uh, due to the release of fresh water. So adding that melted fresh water that is going to reduce the salinity of the seawater, 
reducing the salinity makes it harder for that water to sink. So you're going to prevent the surface water from sinking because it is not dense enough to sink. Um, what that means is that that warm surface water that comes up from uh, the Gulf Stream up to the North Atlantic and then generally sinks, it's not going to be pulled north so far. Um, it's not going to move as far north so the temperatures actually would change all around the North Atlantic Ocean. So for example, um, here we have about 20,000 years ago, the peak of the coldest time on Earth, uh, in the last, the last uh, coldest time on Earth, so the last ice age, we see that there's a lot less heat being transported. So what we're looking at is this green is South America, here is uh, North America, so this is today. Back in uh, the last ice age, we had an ice sheet over a significant portion of North America. Um, there was less warm water, less heat being brought up to the north. Here now today, we have much more heat being brought up to the north. We're losing a lot of heat, to, or releasing a lot of heat to the atmosphere. The water cools, then it becomes more dense, and it sinks down. So the reduction of deep water formation, so reducing how much water is sinking, um, will cause less heat to be transported to the north. So there will be less heat carried to the north. What that translates to is both Europe and North America would be much colder as they have been in the past. So if you've seen the movie Day After Tomorrow, this is the situation that they very inaccurately um, made the movie about, as if the thermal haline circulation completely stopped. Uh, I think in the movie it happened over a couple days, a couple hours. That is so unbelievably unrealistic. The thought was there. They really tried, but they did a poor job. And that's okay. Still an entertaining movie. This is a um, figure showing air temperature changes that would occur due to the shutdown of North Atlantic deep water formation. So if the uh, thermal haline circulation actually did shut down and stopped creating North Atlantic deep water, meaning this water stopped sinking, so the conveyor belt broke, um, we would see some very drastic changes. So a temperature change of minus four degrees is huge. All across the U.S. would get colder. Almost all of the northern hemisphere would get colder by about two or three degrees. Would be um, very, very drastic. However, it is very unlikely that the entire thing would shut down. Um, we are not expecting the thermal haline circulation to shut off, to the, that conveyor belt, as we call it, to break. Um, However, it has been studied and is being shown that the circulation is slowing. So it is slowing down a little bit. So the predictions are that the water in this conveyor belt um, will actually reduce by about 30% in 2100. So it will be creating about 30% less of that deep water. Um, what does this mean for us? Just a slowdown, not a full stop on this circulation. Um, we'd be looking at changes in climate all around the North Atlantic. So things would get a little cooler, um, as well as changes in how much carbon can be stored in the ocean. So a lot of carbon is drawn down by the ocean. We will talk about that more in week four. Uh, so that could have some serious effects if the thermal haline circulation were to really slow by 30%, that could make a really big um, negative <laughs> impact on our climate. So that is what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed learning about how the atmosphere and the ocean move. Next week, remember, our test will be on Tuesday. Study guide is going up on Canvas um, right after I post this video. So it should be up by the time you're looking at this on Thursday. Remember that next week there will be no discussion on Tuesday because you have your test. 
Um, I don't want you to take a test and do a discussion assignment and a homework and a lecture quiz. That is just way too much all in one day. So we will be skipping a discussion on um, Tuesday. However, you still will have the week three part one module work to do. Um, the lecture will be shortened. Week three part two is going to be uh, right back to normal. So good luck and I will see you all on Zoom.